1977, Tottenham Hotspur were relegated from the top flight. They finished bottom of the league and went down to the old second division. The board kept faith with manager Keith Birkinshaw, who returned them to first division status the following season, and thus began another successful chapter in the club's history. North London was crowing about its beautiful football in a period that brought them plaudits on the pitch and trophies off it. With the help of an audacious raid on Argentinian 1978 World Cup heroes Ozzy Ardiles and Ricky Villa, as well as the majestic Glenn Hodlin midfield, Super Spurs returned to former glories, winning back-to-back -back FA Cup finals, challenging for a quadruple of trophies and eventually completing their cup haul in Europe, winning the UEFA Cup. Joining me to share just some of the memories from that time of their lives is the man that captained this talented team. Spurs player, record appearance maker, Steve Perryman, one of the hardest defenders of his time who became known as the baby-faced assassin. <laughs> My next guest was a World Cup winner with Argentina in 1978, who within two months was on his way to Tottenham in one of the most unexpected transfer deals in world football. Osvaldo Ardiles played for ten seasons in London, a competitive and skilled midfielder. Ozzy became a cult hero all over England. And a man that was arguably the jewel in Keith Birkinshaw's crown, his balance and control, unrivaled passing, vision, extraordinary shooting ability, both from open play and in set pieces, made Glenn Hoddle the most gifted English player of his generation. Steve, I have to ask you, baby-faced assassin, <laughs> why? I think Bobby Robson called me that. We had some problems between Tottenham and Ipswich in those times, and uh, it was always a very aggressive physical game, which suited me. And um, perhaps if they come out the worst end of it, then I was the one who took the blame for it. But uh, we were more than the physical side. We had fantastic players, and of course, to balance it out, we needed my type as well. Did he, did he deserve it, Glenn, that, that tag? <laughs> The assassin, I don't know. Steve, Steve is, I think that's a bit unfair. I mean, he was he was a very, very hard player, Steve. I remember watching Stevie when he was, I was a, I was a schoolboy, actually, and I used to see him playing midfield, because when we played, Steve went back to, in the back four, uh, most of the time. Um, but he, uh, he, one thing I, I found out when he was 18, playing in that, you know, in the first team then, that he could look after himself. He mm. could look after himself. But he was a very, very good player. I think sometimes when people talk about Steve to me, I try and say what a good player he was with the ball. And everyone seems to think he's, he was just a defender and a hard defender at that. He Thank was. Thank you very much. But <laughs> he was a very good passer of the ball, indeed. Of course, you've been there in, in the great days under Bill Nicholson, hadn't you, Steve? So were you surprised when Keith Birkinshaw got the job? Terry Neal had gone off to manage elsewhere, of course, mm. and such like that. Outside of Tottenham, you know, Keith Birkinshaw was virtually unknown, wasn't he? Yes, Terry Neal brought him in. Um, no real link to Tottenham. Um, good coach. Done good things with Newcastle. So, um, Terry left unexpectedly back to Arsenal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um, then all the usual suspects came out. And I suppose Sidney Wow had spent a lot of time with Keith, you know, in hotels and travelling with the team. And, Decided that this was a man of you know some sort of uh, ethics and and courage, if you like, and therefore decided to go with him. But it was it was slightly um, surprising because you know Tottenham had been about this flair football and and all of this, and, and Keith really was very dour. But actually, so was Bill Nicholson, and produced great mm. teams. So it, it, it didn't really matter. But but, but you know you, you were relegated, Glenn, and, mm. and he famously let Pat Jennings go and Pat of course went off to play for the Arsenal you know were the players having doubts about him then well I think that was a strange move at the time I think you know looking back you know as managers we've all been in football you make mistakes and I think Keith would have said you know that was one of his mistakes possibly at the time uh, because as you say Pat went on and, uh, and still won trophies at Arsenal but uh, no, like anything Keith got got the job but I think everyone was surprised when he got it at the time but uh, he knew what he wanted. He wanted to rebuild a side. For me, Keith wanted a side that was opposite to him as a player. You know, he used to join in the five sides, and I think you know you could very quickly suss out that you know he wasn't the most creative player. And I think he wanted to channel sort of how he would love to have played the game through his team. And slowly but surely, he he built this side up. But it was a very nerve-wracking uh, season 
before Ozzy arrived, we did all the hard work, didn't we? He comes when you know when we got back into the big time. But it was a very nervous <coughs> season, Steve, wasn't it? Trying yeah. to get back up. I remember going to Southampton. You went to the last game, didn't that you? That last yeah, game, I've never yeah, been yeah. so nervous in a football match in all my life. And yeah. I think it's the only time in my life I never went in front of the ball. But, but I would not go in front of the ball. I just wanted to sit in midfield and say, let's keep the point that we needed. Yeah, well, but thankfully, didn't Southampton feel the same way? Because didn't they need a point to go up as well? Yes. But they ate the post. That wasn't, that wasn't in the script. <laughs> <laughs> so we got even more nervous at that point. But mm. uh, I think we were the two, two of the best teams in the league yeah. at that point. So it was deserved for sure. Yeah. Well, everybody knew about Keith Burke and Shaw, didn't they, when he, he took the plunge. <clears> and, and, you know, was responsible for one of the most sensational mm. coups in English football history when he brought you, Ozzy, Ozzy and Ricky Villa over to this country at a time when it was unheard of, wasn't it? You know, what, what was the first thing that you knew about the possibility of coming to Spurs? <coughs> well, I was, in, uh, I was in Argentina and after the World Cup I wanted to play in Europe. Uh, everybody knew that I wanted to play in Europe, but it never crossed my mind it was going to be England. I was thinking more in Spain, France, Italy, say. But suddenly it was uh, this uh, Durman, as uh, it was, <laughs> as Steve said that, not me, Keith, just in case. Uh, it suddenly he was in Argentina, and basically it was not only me, but it was Ricky as well. So, um, and the contract was on the table, so we had to say yes or no. And suddenly we say yes, and here I am, still. It didn't take you too long to make your mind up then? No, 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 no. I, want, I wanted to play in Europe and suddenly it was, it was Tottenham and suddenly it was, uh, it, was so it, it was London. So It was literally like that. So the, the, the contract was put in front of you <laughs> and you had to make that decision there and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I take a uh, quick So you didn't have a clue where we were? Well, we I were. knew about you and <laughs> I was <laughs> Steve and you about Paul Miller and... <laughs> Amazing. Would you have come without Amazing. Ricky? Would you have come alone? Probably me, yes. Ricky, probably not. Ricky was a little bit reluctant. His wife, he was just married. Christina was a little bit reluctant as well, uh, but uh, somehow my wife, my wife and me we were very positive about it, and uh, somehow we convinced uh, Ricky to come. What, what did the players think about it, Steve, when you heard that, that these two Argentinian World Cup winners were coming? You must have thought it was April Fool's Day, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I picked the paper up one morning on the on the mat, and um, as normal, walking back upstairs, and mm -hmm. so I didn't know anything about this. I was spending hour, two hours a day on the phone to Keith about our team and the way we were playing and in the second division we are playing from the back and playing out and passing and all this stuff. So despite all this conversation he just didn't mention it. <laughs> 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 but he was going to Argentina to, to sign these two wonderful players. So of course as a captain I was asked for a comment and I said you know well, this is wonderful for the club, we're back in the big league, we've signed these terrific players that we've just seen in the World Cup and being successful. And, so how pleased we all were. And then someone wrote me a letter and said, well, what about if you're the player that they're going to replace? You wouldn't be so happy then, would you? <laughs> so then I had to start thinking about, mm. you know, like Neil McNabb, who was a really good player for us, yeah. who probably was going to suffer when Ozzy came and Ricky. You still were very clever. He moved to the defence. <laughs> <laughs> I got out of the way. <laughs> can, can you remember the reaction, Glenn, when they first walked into the dressing room? I remember waiting for them. I was like a little little child waiting for like you know, <laughs> Christmas Day to come round. <laughs> I'd watched them uh, play in the World Cup, and we're in Holland. We were away in a in a training camp in Holland, and uh, Johnny Gorman, I think Jimmy Holmes was. Uh, we were in dormitories of three, and uh, we knew they were coming over to join us. And I tell you, I was so excited. It was uh, it was amazing. And I remember uh, at the same time when probably Steve was talking to, to Keith. I was nego not negotiating. I was talking to Keith about a, a new contract whilst the World Cup was being on. And I remember sitting in his office one day and he kept talking about, have you seen the World Cup? And I said, yeah, I watched every game. Yeah. He said, what about <laughs> number one for Argentina? I said, I said, yeah, great play. He said, do you see how hard he works? you see how, how much the ground he covers? You know, he gets all up. I said, yeah, he's fantastic. You know, <laughs> not dreaming that he was going to fly out there and, and sign him. And uh, so he we was maybe suggesting you should run a bit Exactly, more. Steve. <laughs> I think that was where he was subtly getting the point across. Yeah. And anyway, the, 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 the end of it is we, we're waiting for it. So we, we, we meet the guys and, uh, you know, as I say, all excited. So the first day's training, we'd, you know, the two Argentinians, skillful as anything, coming over. We do a running, typical kid, we're doing a running session. There's a running session. And Ozzy's about three miles behind everyone. <laughs> and I said, I remember saying to Keith, are you sure you've signed the same fella that we spoke about that got around the pitch? And... Uh, no, it, it, uh, we're just so pleased that uh, at the time that the two of them come over because it just elevated us and uh, you know allowed us to play how you know the, the potential of the players that were already there. Yeah.
The first time they played with you, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, it was over in, um, I think it was in Ireland, pre-season. Bohemians, I think we played, and uh, the place was. I think they, got, they must have got about two, two thousand there normally. It was at twenty-three thousand mm. there. It was banged out, and uh, I just remember. No disrespect to guys that I played with at the time, and I don't, I don't mean this to sound bad, but. It was re it was so lovely for me particularly because you know I was a technical player and and I'd give the I'd give balls to Ozzy and, and Ricky, and I remember in them first sort of pre-season games I kept making like a little one-two for and and I didn't always get it back put it that way, <laughs> and this ball kept coming back to me in the perfect bit and I kept saying hallelujah, hallelujah <laughs> we, we you know I, we can play and I could tell instantly that we were going to gel as a midfield because not you know. It, Ozzy, Ricky, and myself, uh, and, and in the end, Tony Galvin sort of came into the left hand side. Tony, you know, none of us were really defenders. We'd all put our foot in, we'd all do our bit for the, for the team. But in the end, that, I think that took a little bit of time for us for that to work, Steve. I think Steve had a big influence with Keith on that, how that was going to work, because we, there wasn't really a defensive minded player. We all wanted the ball, we all knew we could handle the ball. Um, and I think that's why it took a couple of seasons for it to settle in and, and obviously the strike force that we brought in with Steve Archibald and Garth Crook sort of was the icing on the cake. But uh, it was a f refreshing feeling to have, you know, so I remember phoning my dad and saying, Dad, you know, there's two guys here that, you know, can play on the same wavelength, which was fantastic. Well, what were they like, the captain then, Steve, you know, because it must have been difficult to get the message across sometimes. Probably wasn't Graham Roberts as well in fairness, but <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> absolute nightmare. Um, for the great players that they were, for instance, they couldn't take a throw in. They just threw the ball in, meaning this is a restart. <laughs> and you had to cope with it around your neck. So Keith, after about three months, banned them from taking the throw ins. But of course, Ozzy just wanted to play and pick it up and throw it in, whether he was told to do that or not. So, um, but. Yeah, I, I suppose Keith and myself. I was a talented midfield player. I, I was not. Uh, it was not my job to do the throw. <laughs> but you did. You took him yeah. and threw him in our neck. Yeah. So, um, but I think I used to just deal with Keith on that. As per, tell that little shit to <laughs> start giving the ball simple or, or whatever, you know, because I assumed that he would take the the command more off the manager than he would maybe the captain. But you know, all the time along, we were rooming together, you know, between us all, and a lot of travelling, a lot of hotels. And of course, you know, football's a common language in lots of ways. So, you know, we'd, we'd watch games, you know, a league game would be on television or a cup game, and we'd discuss it and know that we're coming from the same direction as per the tactics or the mistake and all of that. So, although they come from the far side of the world, we were actually talking the same language. Yeah. I, remember, I remember you used to say, you used to have a slight problem with, with Ozzy at the beginning when you'd be closing the guy, you're playing right back, he'd be closing his winger and he'd be pinning him down, showing him into an area and suddenly Ozzy would come from nowhere yeah. and whip the ball off the fella's foot and go and, and you know, totally out of position, put Steve out of position and in the end, you know, it was a little bit of this, well don't do that, I'm trying to do this, pinning him down and he kept saying, he just turned around and said, well I keep getting the ball, don't I? Mm. <laughs> but that was adapting <laughs> to each other's style, that's wasn't it? <laughs> because that's obviously what he did a lot. Yeah, he did. That was he wasn't the typical way. midfield player no. of being in the right position and all that, but no. he just used to say where he could go and win the ball mm. and it was normally against my winger yeah which was great for me actually in the end well you needed help <laughs> of course, of course. How, how long was it when you know respect became a sort of secondary factor if you like Glenn and, and the boys began to take the mickey out of them in the dressing room I think that I mean as you say football football language foot, you know when the ball comes out there's a language of its own but I think football around the world is you know the sense of humor that you had I think that was something that instantly happened I remember when when we first met the guys in the dressing room, I think mean, Peter Taylor at the time, who was a great prankster, a really funny guy, Spuddy, mm. and he had this great big plastic thumb on when he went, and he got shot straight up in front of everyone, you know, all the lads are in the dressing room. He's gone over to Ozzy to shake hands with him, and Ozzy's pulled this, this thumb off in his hand and sort of shit himself, <laughs> <laughs> sort of pulled his hand off. And it just sort of broke the ice, and I remember, you know, it was, it was pretty quick. And the good thing about it is that Ozzy and Ricky, not only were they fantastic footballers, but they were really, really special guys. They were so sort of down to earth, no big superstars, we've won the World Cup, look at us. Um, and that made it so much easier for us just to gel in and become eventually a very good team.
and uh, yeah, credit to the guys. Well, we arrived, uh, I mean, Spari was in our, as Glenn said, uh, there were three guys in, in Holland for every room, and they <laughs> he put, put Peter Taylor in our room. <laughs> and 24 hours later, we have all the bad words in the, in the, in the English dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was funny as well. Steve, um, at this stage, you've got these, these great players who come in from abroad, and you've got Glenn, and you've got Tony Garvey, and you've got some great strikers. Did you, did you get the sense then that you were on the verge of something special? It was an absolute delight to play in this team. And of course we lost games, no doubt, but we, we sort of knew why we lost, therefore what we have to do next. And we, it, it we, was had, just we, had, we had a little bit of, you know, the, the, we did have teething problems. It was an instant success. I remember the first game, we had a great pre-season, as I said, it was great to play with Ozzy and Ricky and we were building something. First game at home, White Hart Lane, we lost 4-1. Mm -hmm. It's Aston Villa, ticker tape everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Argentinian sort of World Cup style, this is great. We got hammered 4 1 at home, and you're thinking, hello, there's a bit of work to be and done. And the next one, we lost 7 0 against Liverpool. I think it wasn't too far uh, after that. We lost 7 0 as well, yeah. I think it was the next game. Yeah, so it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't. It didn't all fall into place early mm. doors. We really did have to work hard mm. to, to actually get the blend right. You know? we, were, we, we were in a different. I mean, we, Rick, and, Rick and me, I would say Glenn as well, but Glenn was more because he had been playing in the, more in the English way, he, not, not so much him, but. Uh, we really were defending in a kind of Argentinian way, uh, and everybody else was playing, was defending uh, English way. So somehow it was no no working at all. Even when we had the balls, half of the team we were playing, try to play much more, I would say South American football, but the rest of the team have not. So it, it took quite a while to to put everything together. When when we started to do that, I would say it was in the third year, in 1881, yeah. mm. suddenly the team becoming very, very special, very, very special indeed, and it was really, really a pleasure to play there. I mean, I think, I think it was really, um, we played some lovely football at the beginning, mm. but I, I think no disrespect to the guys that were there up front at the time, but we would create a lot, but we needed that finishing, you know, any team, any good team needs good finishing at the end of the day. It doesn't, doesn't matter how many chances you create, mm. you've got to have somebody to put the ball in the back of the net. And I think with, with Crooksy and, and Archibald coming to the so team, for me, that, that set the pattern, you know, it was the icing on the cake, as I say, and it just allowed us to see the fruits of all the good work, you know, that we'd done. Hang on, the ball's in the back of the net. And when you're winning matches, that's when creative football can be played at its purest and its best, because your your, your confidence is, is is sky high. And uh, it, it was a, pl it was, it was yeah, a the, pleasure to our play. Our midfield was all the time the same, right from the beginning. You, Ricky, myself and Tony, for example. But mm. it, it was, it, the defence needed to sort to be solid out Absolutely. and a front score when, mm. when Gaff and, and Steve arrived, yeah. it, it was a different... Oh no, you needed that solid base at the oh. back there, and I tell you what, Ray Clements come in as well. There was a there was a unit of five: Richard, yourself, yeah. yourself, Maxi, Robbo, and and, and Chris Chrissy Uton, and with, with with Clem coming and and really organising the voice was yes. incredible, wasn't it? You know. Very much. Yeah. You, you mentioned Garth Crooks. Did he talk a lot in those days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He did. <coughs> he did. But a good character, great yeah. character, yeah. great great lad, wasn't he? Great Bubbly. lad. Bubbly character. He started into his radio days then, which I suppose led him into the TV. Mm. But we had J Jerry Armstrong before those two come, and Jerry, in a, in a particular team, mm. was terrific, as he showed in the 82 World Cup, was it, in mm. Spain, and scored Absolutely. goals and stuff. But, you know, when Aussies lending him a little ball to get a return ball, that wasn't Jerry's. Jerry needed field to run into and, mm. and power, you know. So, and, and we also felt that um, they would get in positions with a ball by the good player, and we would think we're going to get an English cross here. Yeah. And of course, they wouldn't cross it, they'd cut back and try and play it to the edge of the box for a shot and stuff like that. So it, it was about us all getting used to each other. Which, which for me was, at, for me personally, was fabulous. You know, Mark Falco used to get so annoyed and, and, and criticised. But I, very quickly, I'd see Ozzy and Ricky, and I'd think, they don't cross it. And it was an Argentinian thing, they would not cross it. And I thought, oh, this is great, hang on a minute, if I just keep arriving on the penalty spot or around in the D, I'm going to get, get me chances for me. So for me personally, it worked out really well. And I think it was one season I, I did score a lot of goals yeah. in one of the yeah, years, yeah. coming yeah. on to things. Whereas the strikers in England, that you, you're used to sort of pulling off the back post or getting across the front post, and they used to get a little bit frustrated, <laughs> the boys, when the <laughs> lads wouldn't cross it. Coming <laughs> <in>. <laughs> uh, I mean, let's talk about that, that 81 final, because there are lots of things to remember about it, aren't there? I mean, not least of all, Aussie's dream, which must have, <laughs> must have haunted you forever, the, the, yes. the cup 
song, you know. And that's, do people still ask you about it, Ossie? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about it at the time? I mean, in, in some respects, you hadn't been in the country very long, so, you know, suddenly, it was almost a tribute, wasn't it, the fact that, you know, it, oh, it was, the it was, cup, it, cup record it, was named after you? Well, yes, it, it, it was great. Um, of course, when we did the, the, the song, I never, it never crossed my mind that I have a, a line for myself, say. <laughs> so uh, after a few drinks with the boys, they somehow they convinced me to, to do it. I, I felt very, uh, not particularly happy to, <laughs> to be doing that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was the thing to do. And now, for example, after all this year, I, I am happy. And I think the, the song was, was, was a pretty good one. Mm -hmm. I mean, Glenn and Chris Waddle after the, they, they carry on with this kind of uh, <laughs> career. <laughs> career, but uh, <laughs> Come on, Ozzy, you've got to give us the line again. In the cup for Tottingham, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Tottingham, all over it. Mm. <laughs> what did you boys make of it, Glenn? What did you think of Ozzy's dream? It, it was just, well, it was just fantastic. It was great to get, you know, as Steve said earlier, Spurs fans were, were just desperate for success. It had been lean years. So to get to a cup final was one thing that was great. But then, you know, as a kid, watching all these cup finals and the dream and you know Steve had, had been to League Cup finals I believe before in mm. UEFA but not an FA Cup yeah. and as a kid when you see all these cup finals over the years you always knew that there was a cup final song to be done and it was fantastic you know and then to get Chaz <laughs> and Dave involved and then <laughs> obviously it was just perfect you know I, I suppose if, for anyone outside of White Hart Lane and uh, the fans of, of Tottenham it's probably not too good but it was, <laughs> it was great fun it really was and I remember he had more than just a few beers by the way <laughs> to get him to go out there and sing mm. you must feel the odd one out here steve because the only one who's not been a pop star you know with these two with their singing roles <laughs> but when i listen to that song sometimes you go to tottenham and they play these songs to come out to or to finish the game i can actually hear my voice <laughs> i can actually just pick myself out it was interesting because we had to go on blue peter why else would we go on our type go on blue peter to, to promote this record and and we did the first sort of practice and the famous producer director i think billy baxter yeah came down and she said, look, chaps, do yourself a favour. Is that, if that's as good as you can do, go on now, because that's not, that's, we're not having it. So one of the Chaz and Dave's they backroom staff said, look, love, do yourself a favour, get a couple of crates of beer. Yeah. So then the beer came out, so the next one and the next Beer one, on Blue Peter. Yeah, <laughs> behind the scenes, <laughs> behind the scenes, for sure. But then we were proper, then, yeah. we, then we could handle it, and Ozzy could deliver the line. Mm. But uh, you mean, on the day, in the, in the first game against Manchester City, I mean, it didn't go to plan, did it? And, and particularly for Ricky, for Ricky Villa, sure. who was substituted, you know, did, did he just find the whole occasion too much? I think the no, game was no, live no, no, in no, no. Ricky, Ricky was like that. I mean, um, it, was, it was a big game. It was the 100th game in the, the FA. The, mm. the 100th FA. It was the first game in tele, tele, televised uh, uh, live to Argentina. Mm. All our family were watching there. So Ricky was very much, uh, I mean, he wanted to play really, really well. But Ricky was, was like that. I mean, with Ricky, mm. you never knew if he was going to play well or he was going to play bad. And in the morning, somehow I sensed that he wasn't that good. We were roommates, and, and of course, he had a very, very bad game. After the game, he asked me, if, oh, see, I was that bad because he was very cross with Keith at, at the time, <laughs> this manager and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and he said, he asked me, oh, see, was I that bad? I said, yeah, he was <laughs> really, really bad. Oh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But he made up for it. Oh, no. very, very much. Well, yeah, the yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. about from the from the Saturday to the I think we played on a Thursday, didn't Thursday, we? Yeah. That, that it, what, was he going to play or wasn't he going to play? Right. That was the big question because Gary Brooks had come on. You know, Brooksy mm -hmm. was a good player, and it was a, a, a tough. Day. Keith must have had a real sort of do I play him? You know, was he that bad? And I think what well, as he said, and, and Ricky would 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 admit this. He, he would admit it openly. He said, "I'm either there." Yeah. Or I'm there. That's right, yeah. So and I think Keith must have thought to himself, well, I've seen that. I think he's going to go straight back to his top form, which Ricky could do that. I think he, he took a lot with you, Steve, probably, Keith, mm -hmm. before the, the next few days. and Just after the, the end of the game, he mm. said, uh, would you play Ricky second game? Just no. say no. <laughs> I showed my managerial potential <laughs> there. No, he said, why not? I said, because he got taken off, he left the team, he walked mm. head down around the track, he didn't watch the rest of the game. This is not team, I, I'm all about team. Mm. And uh, he said, well, I'm telling you now, he's playing. Well done, you're the man. So he didn't have all them sleepless nights no, in between. He knew, I thought he, had. he knew at the end of the game <laughs> he was going to play. 
he already made the decision then. Yeah. And, of course he, 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 and I think he told Ricky that he was going to play. Yeah. Maybe Ricky didn't tell other players. He didn't tell Brooks. Well, well, Ricky was. <laughs> 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 no. Well, no, no. Ricky was not talking to him at the time. He was. They were not. Uh, oh, well, in, Keith was definitely yeah, in his yeah. mind. He was going to play. Mm. Yeah. Well, immediately in the, in the next training or two, two three days later, we, we started to do a little, little bit of football, and, and he played the team that we were going to play, yes. obviously. Mm. And Keith and Ricky was in the in the team. Yeah. Mm. D did he get the feeling that Thursday morning then, Ozzy, that this was going to be Ricky's day well, was, was he up you again you never know Ricky mm -hmm. I mean it could mm -hmm. happen that he was rubbish again of course mm -hmm. but uh, suddenly when he scored the first goal after four or five minutes that gave him a lot lot mm -hmm. of confidence he was a completely different player and in fact he was a completely different player from from the next year as well Ricky because until that moment Ricky somehow had not played to his full potential mm -hmm. I always felt he, f he felt a little bit in your shadow if truth be known, you, you, mm. you'd come as the World Cup winner and played every game for Argentina. And I think you're right, Oz, that just put the chains off him. And he, we saw that, the best of Ricky. Yes, you know. the, nec the next season. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that final, when he scored the, the, the two goals, especially the day goal, mm. and, and after that, the next year, he was he was really, really wonderful. Until that, he was he was all the time a little bit, not with the, enough confidence to say, well, here I am, I'm going to play well, and so on. Mm. It was always a question mark how, how he was going to play. Mm. Brilliant or, or pretty bad? <laughs> I mean, we've seen that wonder goal replayed mm. so many times. Do, do you remember it unfolding on the day? Can you, you sort of still see it in your mind's eye, Glenn? I, I, I can, and I tell you, if you watch it closely when we watched it back, you see Garth Crook's <laughs> yes. right foot sort of go three times as if hit it, Ricky, and his leg actually moves. And I tell you, I remember <laughs> saying the same thing to myself. I didn't actually move my legs, but I was saying, hit it, Rick. <laughs> hit it, Rick. For crying hit out loud, hit bloody the thing. Hit yeah. thing, yeah. And uh, what a wonder goal. It was just fantastic, like a little slalom, wasn't it, the way he went through. And uh, it was strange, but I, I don't know about the guys, but I, I felt from the Saturday to the, to the Thursday, after the, you know, the first game, I knew that the, the vibe that we had, we yep. knew we hadn't played that, I knew we were going to win. Mm -hmm. Even at 2-1 down, there was just such a strong feeling in that place, in the way we trained, the way we... We knew we'd... It was interesting, like you said about Ricky, with, with all the, the game going back to Argentina. Mm. I felt that's how we were as a team. We were pretty naive. There was a lot of yeah. homegrown yes. lads. And we played very individual before the game. I remember the one thing we said for the second game, no looking up, waving to your, to your missus or your, to your parents. You focused on it. But the first game, I think it was the cup final. You know, I've been waiting years for this. And everyone was the same. We were really We're all a little bit, you know. Trip. It was a bit too big, big. We wanted to all do well, but we went individual rather than as a team. And yeah. I just felt that week, the preparation for that week, we, we were going to win that game. I think we were very lucky for in the, in the first game. Very, very lucky. Mm. But once we survived the first game, I mean, mm. the, we were odds on to win the, the second game. We were very, very lucky. In confident. saying that, though, Joe Corrigan got man of the match in the first, in the first game. game yeah. Which hmm. we couldn't have been that bad, could we? <laughs> mm. oh, you, you went the wild for it, Steve. So, what was the feeling like lifting that FA Cup? Well, again, lean spell, as Glenn mentioned. This great club had sort of hit rock bottom by getting relegated. It took some years for us to gather again, reform. Then, eventually, you're at Wembley and you can put yourself back on a sort of success stage. And we've obviously got a good team and we didn't do well in the first game, we did much better in the second one and we were winning it and losing it and eventually won it with such a great goal. And then, so you're having the best day of your life. You know, the second game on the Thursday, the more tickets available, all your people could be there that you needed there, which mm -hmm. couldn't get there the first game because of the lack of tickets or whatever. And um, this is the, officially the best day of your life. Um, we're happy and we're joyful and we've, we've gained our credibility back after some lean years. And especially me as captain who led us down and, yes, led us back, but hadn't matched up to these great teams of the past. And then every, th this is a perfect day. And then someone taps you on the shoulder, <laughs> turn around, <laughs> says, go pick the cup up. Now this is officially, because <laughs> as Glenn says, you know, growing up in England as a kid, mm -hmm. the only game you ever really saw live on telly was the, was the FA Cup. Mm -hmm the odd international or two, but really FA Cup day was the day where you sat in and watched football and then before it and after it, you went out on the road and kicked the ball around and you tried to copy what you'd just seen on television. And now you were doing this thing, walking mm. up those steps that you'd seen 
captains do for 25 years before. This is it. Yeah, and it underlined our great performance, what a good team we were, how we were sort of back on a, a, a success sort of platform, if you like. And, um, and it led to further success yeah. after that, of did, course. Did I, did, am I wrong in real? Did some bright spark jump in front of you? And jumped give about, you a hug, didn't he? Jumped he? about six rows down, <laughs> and landed on me, and cuddled me, <laughs> and said, "Sorry, Steve," <laughs> <laughs> as if he'd sort of messed up my day. Uh, you couldn't, you, you couldn't absolutely mess couldn't mess no. it up. I don't vaguely really remember that the fellow jumped yeah. out, and yeah, yeah. So so you, I was standing right behind you. you. I made sure I was second in. Yeah, <laughs> you got a marvelous, beautiful, historic trophy in your hands, and you know the last thing you want is for anybody then to go and damage it. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you, Ozzy? <laughs> no, well, uh, it was You paid it. for the damage, yes? <laughs> no, I didn't. No. <laughs> what was the story? Uh, I think I dropped it in the, in, in the bath, yes? No, I'll tell you exactly what. <laughs> <laughs> He's dropped it in the bath. Yeah. When you've played, and it's such a big occasion, obviously, you haven't had much in your stomach, so I remember he couldn't hold his drink at the best of times. <laughs> He's come straight back in and he's chucking this down out of the cup. We're all drinking out of the cup, aren't we? Champagne, as you do. Fantastic. So he's, he's half cut by the time. And you remember the notorious big bath at Wembley? Yeah. It, was, it was a real deep, you know, it would be up to here on me, so he had oh. no chance. So <laughs> all of a sudden, he's coming half cut with a cup. He's jumped in the bath. As he's jumped in, he's thrown the, he's thrown the cup up in the air. It's hit the roof. Well, no one's thought of anything. We've all sort of gone in it, and now he's, he's drowning, isn't he? He can't stand up. He's too, so I remember, I think it was Robbo and Max here holding him up underneath, and we're all singing and that. And then one of us has took a look at this cup, and we've picked the cup up, and there's a two-inch dent in, the, in the, the rim of the bloody cup. And then all of a sudden, we've looked at him, you little Argentinian, and we're trying to now drown him underneath this. And I remember going back to the Chanty Claire, and we, we, we said, if anyone has a photo with a cup with your parents, turn, with your, it, yes. turn it round and keep your hand over that two-inch dent mm. in the FA Cup. It was 100 years as well, Centenary Cup final, mm. and you went and ruined the cup. Boss. I don't remember very much. To be <laughs> <laughs> I just remember it was a great, 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 great night. I mean, the second night, the first, the first game as well, but the second mm. night, when, when we won the cup, it was something that it was... Incredibly, incredibly nice, and we were all in the mm. in the res dressing room as soon as the, as the game was over. Incredibly, incredibly happy. I think, did you not say that, that you didn't realise you'd, you'd gone through the World Cup and everything? And oh, I knew, I knew. What was he saying? Oh, yes. Yeah. If you didn't realise how big this was, mm. you know, we're making records and live TV and then mm. come to the hotel before the game. I remember you saying that, which yeah, was, yeah, yeah. you know, for me, it was... But well, this is what, in a way, they did the song before the game. Mm. Uh, it was my dream, definitely. It was my dream to, to play in Wembley. I wanted to play in the best stadium in the world. Mm. Wembley was the cathedral, was, I mean, the stadium. Yeah. And yes, I, I wanted to play in Wembley badly. And to play in, in, in the occasion of the FA Cup is uh, just, just great. I have to say, the FA Cup is not so much right now, but at the time mm. it was, mm. if you ask any any English player you want to win the league or you want to win the FA Cup, the majority will say at the time, we want to win the FA Cup. Yeah, you see how, how great it was. So, Ozzy, less than a, a year after that FA Cup triumph, you played in the semi-final mm. against Leicester. Right. And the following day, I think it was, the Falklands, the Malvinas are invaded. Mm. Uh, did you realise immediately, you know, what, what a crisis is going to be for you personally? Yes, I, somehow I, I, I had a feeling that it was going to be bad. The invasion was uh, before the semi-final, in fact. Um, so, in the morning of the game, uh, it was a lot of uh, reporters. Um, obviously, it was a semi-final. It was very important. In, in, it was very important in his own. But that means there were a lot, a lot of reporters. But there were a lot, a lot more reporters. Uh, not sport, not football reporters, but uh, normal reporters. Say. So uh, it, it was. I, I had a feeling at the time that it was going to be it going to be escalating to, to something really, really bad, uh, and, and it did. What was the 
immediate public re reaction towards you. Was there any animosity? No, no, no. The immediate, the immediate public reaction was uh, was great. I mean, we played the the, the semi final. We, we won the semi final. Um, but that, that was just starting. I mean, Argentina just invaded. It was not. We were not at war, for example. The war was about uh, one month away. But I remember going to going to Argentina. I said to Steve, well, Steve, uh, <laughs> they're going to be probably a lot of things that they're going to be to appear in the paper. Me saying things and so on. You. I assure you right now that it's going to be completely and utterly untrue because I'm not going to say anything about uh, anything. So it was, a, it was a very, very difficult period in, in my life. It probably was yeah. very difficult for the boys as well. Mm. Because I, I, I would imagine that you've got the English press on one hand mm. and the Argentinian press on the That's other right. hand. And yes. both want you to say completely opposite things. That's right. The English press wanted to say England is great, the Argentina press wanted to say Argentina is great and so on and it was uh, it, it was it, it was terrible for Rick and for me. Um, the two countries from in from, from my point of view, uh, the country that I was born, I was fighting with the country that where I where I was working, the country that was uh, my adopted me say. So uh, it was it, it was awful. Um, after and, and the world was coming after, say, when, when it was actually war, when the people from England, people from Argentina were starting to die, and it was it was very difficult. D did you feel, Steve, as captain, you know, that you'd seen the last of Aussie and, and Ricky then? Ricky stayed, didn't he, he stayed in England, so, but whether he was going to keep playing, if, mm. if the, particularly the opponent crowd were going to focus on him and give him some stick, then maybe he, with Ricky's sort of mentality, maybe that was going to affect him maybe more than you in a, in a way. Mm. Um, I, I think that we, of course, respected Aussie and, you know, it's not just Aussie, it's the family and everything surrounding it. So these are really decent people, so we don't want to think bad of them at all, even if something else is going on, you know, thousands of miles away. So we really just wanted him to come back because we knew what he meant to our team and you know, it might be a little bit sort of insular thinking that, thinking about your own situation, your team, but uh, this was a bigger problem, but we just wanted him back. Mm. And you've gone on, you've won a second consecutive FA Cup against mm. Queen's Park Rangers. I think he scored the, the winning goal, didn't you, Glenn, mm. that day? But, but was the gloss taken off it by the events you know, surrounding Ozzy and Ricky? I think the, the gloss had taken, was taken off in between the semi-final and the final, yeah. There was, uh, we felt for the guys without any shadow of a doubt. Uh, we wanted, you know, the war wasn't going to last forever, so we, I personally felt, felt the boys, you know, the guys at Aussie would be coming back. I didn't see that as a, as a major long term uh, in football terms. Um, but to be honest, you know, when you get to the final again on that day, as you say, all that goes out the window and Aussie, Aussie would be the same if he was playing and it was somebody else. When you're professionals, you know, uh, to win it again. And particularly that season, we had had a fantastic season. We were three minutes away from winning the League Cup. Mm. Uh, that was our, our best season. It was. That was the best team we have in 1981-82. Yeah. yeah. And that was our, our best season, certainly. Mm. Um, we went to the semi-finals of the Cup Winners' Cup. Barcelona knocked us out. They kicked lumps out of us in the, the home leg, do you remember? And then they got a 1-0 victory uh, in the new Camp. And uh, we really, that year, we, we had a great chance to win the league. I think we ended up third, but we, we had... Um, yeah, we had a lot of games. At we the had end. eight games in 16, right. 17 yeah. days, I think, yeah. Steve, you said, didn't you? Ten, ten in 23. Yeah. So because so of the winter, I think... Play, there was rest, mm. play, rest, yeah. with the an extra games. rest. That was amazing with the small squad that we had. Because yeah. we had the semi-final of the League Cup was two games, wasn't it? Yeah. There was two legged games yeah. at the beginning of the League Cup, if I and remember. And it was a bad winter as well, so yeah. that, that took yeah. a huge, that took about six weeks yeah. out of the league programme. So with all this happening, mm. we just... So getting back to the point of what you said, the question was, you know, uh, that, that all went on with us, but at the end of the day, the team and the club felt we'd played so well. To come out of that season with nothing, would have been an absolute travesty yeah. and, and I think the fact that we held on in there and we, we won a replay again um, w was justification what was a fabulous team as Ozzy says I think that was probably our best season the football we played. It, it was still a couple of years before Keith Birkinshaw would finally leave the club Steve but did you get any impression at that stage of, of any disillusionment that, that Keith had I mean we hear stories about you know dressing room conflicts and the, you know, they didn't get on with Steve Archibald and so on and so forth. W w was there any feeling that maybe Keith's time was running out? No, not really. Um, they were normal things that happened in any dressing room. So, uh, you know, you're all different characters. You come together as a team, but when you leave that 
training field or go home or you know away from the games you are your own individual people and, and of course Steve was was a particular character he saw things in a in a in a in a sort of a striking way a more sort of selfish way I suppose um, and some of us were more team players and we had flair and, and all these things that made us a great team and um, you know after four or five years of really good success you know you, you're not really going to accept it at that point are you and yeah. especially people coming in from the outside who may own the club but don't necessarily know what they're talking about football wise and I think this grated so much against him he, he just yeah. couldn't really take that part of mm. it but very, from a football perspective he was fine very principled man wasn't yeah. he Keith and, and I think that was when you think back to those days it's just won the UEFA Cup how can you sack a, a guy or, or, or give him the opportunity to go and leave a club when the success he'd already brought. decided hadn't he before yeah. the UEFA Cup yeah. final yeah. he was going yeah but it was obviously the first sort of phase or the first example of the modern day football club coming out yeah. And it's 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 now gone, you know, right down that that line, isn't it? it the, the, the continentals, the European way, was that way at the time, and I think Irving Scholar felt that that's how he wanted to to, to run the club, and um, I don't think that uh, there was any re you know behind the scenes reason that he felt Keith was the wrong man. Obviously not. Keith was in the middle of success. We had a mm. good side, come through a lot together, and there was no reason why success couldn't be uh, you know continued. I'm sure. Mm. Keith, Keith actually told me that he'd received, he took a log in the end, he, he received 36 calls in one day from Irving Scholar about all sorts of, have you thought about going so-and-so for pre-season? Yes, it's, we've arranged it. <laughs> have you thought, do you know so-and-so's available from Valencia? Mm. Yeah, I knew that about two months ago. And it was all about these things <laughs> and it just wore him down. He, he didn't believe that someone in that, that position of a club should have that much mm. influence on the manager so it was the new against mm. the old if you like mm. and there was going to be some sort of fight as per who was going to win this yeah. and Keith actually just didn't want the fight he didn't want to be part of that so one thing I'd like to say is Keith had the, the, the open-mindedness to, to you even in 81 to use a sports psychologist the pair of them you know John yeah. and Chris we, we were using a, a sports psychologist that actually I could see at the time really did break down a lot of the stumbling blocks were there because players would say things to, 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 to that type of guy than they would do to maybe the coaching staff and there were some stumbling blocks that were broken down by yeah. working with him as a yeah. team as a team unit so again he was he was open-minded enough and, and aware uh, you know of what was needed and, and he was open-minded enough to let you go in goal <laughs> on more than one occasion. Tell us about Glenn Hoddle, the goalkeeper. I, I, I don't think he had any, uh, any choice in that <gasps> one. We decided that on the pitch. Yeah. It was, Ellen Road was the first. I ended up in goal three times. How did that ever happen? Anyway, Ellen Road, but, uh, Barry Danes got injured and had to go off. And in, in then, those days, it was one sub. So we're away. I think it was one all at a time or whatever the scores. I can't remember. Johnny Pratt was sub. So he comes bounding on John, you know, game as anything, <laughs> pray. Here's the gloves, I'm going in goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone said, fuck off, John, you're too short to go in goal. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, we're absolutely just having this discussion as Danes is getting put on the stretcher. So, like Steve said, well, I've, I've never been. And we're all looking at each other, and stupidly, in my youth, I said, well, and this is God's only truth. Well, I used to like going in goal over the park with my <laughs> mates, and they went, there you go, Rod, and these gloves, and that was how oh, the decision you. was made. <laughs> and I ended up in goal. And I, how I, did he do? Did very well. Yeah. Oh. On three occasions. We won the game, 2-1, yeah. I remember. We, how we won, I don't know, but Pat Welton was assistant manager then. Well, that, he was at a that time. He was a goalkeeper. And I remember getting to half-time, sitting down and he spent <laughs> 10 minutes telling me I, I was so this was the first half you were in the first, first half, half yeah, yeah yeah and uh, a lot of people say they played better without me out, outside on the pitch but <laughs> you were trying to tell you the he's trying to tell me all the all the all the, all the goalkeeping <laughs> things that you know Pat Jennings knew in 10 years in, in 10 minutes and I was so confused uh, you know I've got to be there where when the cross is coming in I thought oh, I saw it just go and punch the ball and kick it, it. it worked because you were in goal again at Old Trafford were you well that was that was amazing because that was the FA Cup. Ozzy scored a, a wonderful goal, and I think Joe Jordan had gone and clattered uh, Amelia Alexic again. Yeah, accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was, yeah, back in front of the Stratford end. I remember snooker ball nearly took my head off. 
I got a snooker ball just went past my head, and I thought, sod this for a game of soldiers, and I, I kept kept myself right out on the uh, edge of the penalty area. But it, all, all great experience. We won that game. I think I was a lucky omen in goal. Mm. I think Norwich, Norwich as well, two two we drew. Yeah. So, uh, so when did your goalkeeping career end? A fella called Graham Roberts came and joined yeah. the club, and ah. I remember Ray Clements got got carried off, and Robbo at Fulham. Yeah, at Fulham. So everyone looked at me thinking. I've been in goal before, and Robbo went, I'll fancy it, I'll fancy it. I went, Grant, <laughs> you can have that one. So I handed me gloves over then. Yeah. Was he the toughest player you played with, Steve, Graham Roberts? Um, no. No. Who, who would that be then? Uh, I think Paul, Paul Miller was Z. tougher. Mm. Day in, day out, every day. Um, interesting character, Paul Miller. The, the team was actually full of characters. Mm. And I w had the pleasure and the honour of rooming with him in his first ever away game. For whatever reason, the manager put him with me somewhere up in the Midlands. And uh, he took a suitcase. So he's put the suitcase on the bed and he's un opened it up and he's got a dressing gown out and then <laughs> something else. And I said, well, he had slippers as well. <laughs> I said, you haven't got a pipe in there as well, have you? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, fine, okay. So he said, Steve, listen, before we go down for the evening meal, um, do you mind, I've never sort of really eaten out before, do you mind if I, whatever you order, I follow you? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So we go downstairs, I tell the chaps about the dressing gown and all that. <laughs> they straight away said David Niven. They called him David Niven. <laughs> so, um, so I ordered white bait and Chateaubriand. And he went, Steve, Steve, no, 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 no. no. Leave me out the wine. I don't want any wine. And, uh, <laughs> I'd, re I'd really like a bit of steak. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wonderful yeah. you must have had a word with Keith then, because I had him for the next nine years. <laughs> <laughs> I got rid of him. I got rid of him. Uh, but the team, the team was full of those characters. Yeah, Tony Calvin right. was a great player, wasn't he, for mm. us? Mm. What, a, what a foil, what a balance out there on that left-hand side. Yeah, well, yeah. Terrific player. And uh, yeah. Archibald and Crooks in their own way, the way that they, their movement, and fed off of Glenn's passes and Ozzy's trickery. Lots of lots of wonderful moments. Grant Roberts, of course, was a very very tough player, and um, you know the great things for us within that UEFA Cup win and eventually pick the cup up and all of that. He was a tough boy, no doubt. But uh, hey, and, and a very good captain, by the way. Don't let him. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Captain. And then Ray Clements come after Melia, and, and he just sort of topped it off as well. Mm. So mm. foreign influence. So a good group of people together. So it, it really was a good time in our lives. Mm. Wonderful times. Uh, Steve, Glenn, Ozzy, thanks very much indeed for sharing those memories with us. Very well.